The Old Testament lesson comes to us this morning from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 4, verses 5 through 10. In the Pew Bible, it's uh, on page 128. Deuteronomy, chapter 4, beginning with verse 5. Before that, Moses reminds Israel that God is with him and that it is wisdom to keep his commandments. Deuteronomy 4, 5. See, I have taught you decrees and laws as the Lord my God commanded me, so that you may follow them in the land you are entering to take possession of it. Observe them carefully, for this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations, who will hear all about these decrees and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. What other nation is so great as to have their gods near them the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to him? And what other nation is so great as to have s such righteous decrees and laws as this body of laws I am setting before you today? Only be careful and watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them slip from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. Remember the day you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb when he said to me, Assemble the people before me to hear my words, so that they may learn to revere me as long as they live in the land, and may teach them to their children. The New Testament lesson comes from Ephesians 4, 20 through 24, and it's on the, in the Pew Bible, it's on page 829. Paul reminds the church in Ephesus that knowing Christ in truth means to live as Christ taught us to live. Ephesians 4, beginning with verse 20. You, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth as in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Our gospel lesson comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 16 through 20 on the Pew Bible, it's page 706. Would you please rise if you're able for the reading of our gospel? This is the Great Commission. Jesus gives the Great Commission, which is our purpose. Included is an order to teach them to obey everything I command you. Matthew 28, beginning with verse 16. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This concludes the reading of the lessons. You may be seated. Well, there's one Olympic athlete I remember from 1968 who still holds the world record in his event. It was the Summer Olympics. Does anybody remember that one, the Olympic and world record from way back when? I'm not... Long jump, and who was that? Uh, Bob Beeman, 29 feet and two inches. And it seemed like he broke the record like a foot and a half or something, and he still holds that record. Um, but, you know, I also learned something else in the children's sermon. You know, I didn't, I wasn't, I was good in some things. I was better at baseball, but not real good at anything. And I didn't win any trophies like that, those cool things like Adam had. And, but I learned something that was a, a real advantage because we've moved about 18 times, and so I don't have any broken trophies, so that's a good thing. Matthew's gospel has two distinct emphases. I want to talk about... Uh, a little bit about those, but I want to focus on the Great Commission. But his two, two emphases, first of all, the gospel is written to show that Jesus is the Messiah, that he fulfills all the Old Testament prophecies about the Anointed One. And secondly, Matthew is written 
as a teaching gospel. Matthew, the very name Matthew means disciple or follower, and of course one who follows a teacher. And Matthew is good. His, his gospel is written to teach us. In the Old Testament, the first five books, we know them as Genesis through Deuteronomy, they're known as the books of the law or the books of Moses. And the other name for them, the real name is the Torah or the Torah, which means the law or teaching. And uh, Matthew organizes his gospel around five teachings, five speeches of Jesus. And you can find those in chapters 5 through 7, which is the Sermon on the Mount, chapters 10, 13, 18, and then again in 24 and 25. Moses begins the Torah or the law with the creation of the world. And he ends it with Moses giving last instructions to the nation of Israel. And in the same way, Matthew begins his gospel with the establishment of the kingdom of God. And he ends it with Jesus' final instructions to the church. And so we see a lot of uh, similarity between Matthew and Moses. And that's intentional. It's meant to teach us that Jesus is the fulfillment uh, even of creation, because he gives us the new creation. He shows us not only how to be human, but how to be divine as well. And so Matthew is the teaching gospel. The final instruction Jesus gave us in Matthew, we know is the Great Commission, which was in our uh, gospel lesson today, which most of you probably know that by heart. Uh, today, I am the foc that my focus is on the first part of verse 20 which says, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. So often uh, in the Christian church, when we consider the Great Commission, we focus on the other parts of it, the going. Everybody's real excited about foreign missions, and it's important. I don't want to minimize any of these things because it's important. We go out to foreign countries. We go out in our own neighborhood as well. Go, Jesus said. And he said, make disciples. We preach, we proclaim the word, we proclaim the good news. We're all sinners, but Christ came to save us. That's what it's all about. We, we want to awaken a hope within people. We want to awaken a desire to follow Jesus, make disciples of all nations. We emphasize baptizing them. We want to get them saved, get them into the church, and begin to observe the Lord's sacraments and all his commands. But then there's the part teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And we seem to be a little bit afraid of that. Teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Not sure if that's because we're afraid of lapsing back into some kind of works righteousness or what. The idea that we do enough good and then we can get to heaven. That can't be done. We're saved by grace through faith. We know that. That's the great truth of the reformation you are saved by grace the grace of god through faith faith in jesus christ not of works lest anyone should boast and yet that's part of the great commission that's our purpose is the great commission that doesn't matter what we say on our uh, constitutions and on our church doors and on our bulletins and everything the purpose of every christian church is to is that great commission Go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. That's why we're here. That's our purpose. And why, then, is that obedience, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you? And we, of course, know it just follows logically. If we're to teach other people that, that's our command, too. We need to be doing that very same thing, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Why is that so important then? I want to mention five reasons for our prompt and cheerful obedience to Christ. And that's exactly the type of obedience that he's looking for as well. First of all, obedience confirms the gospel. We can say and say and say whatever we want, but people won't listen if we don't live it. And we're all familiar with the saying, practice what you preach which is actually a, a paraphrase of what Jesus described about the scribes and Pharisees. They didn't practice what they preached. But that phrase, practice what you preach, originates in Matthew 23, and it's important. 
the way we live should back up our message. If I should tell you, you should wear New Balance running shoes because they'll make you stronger and faster, but then I don't wear New Balance running shoes. What does that say? It says maybe New Balance isn't so good as I've said they are. And it's the same way with the gospel. Our obedience to that message shows, among other things, the validity of the message. It has been said, you're the only Jesus that some folks will ever see. And they'll see it because of the way we live. Hebrews 12, <coughs> verse 14, makes that point very clearly. He says, make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. We witness both by our words and by our deeds. Secondly, obedience confirms and strengthens our own faith as well. We're all familiar with the Apostles' Prayer, I think, and we, I'm sure, have prayed it ourselves, Lord, increase our faith. We all want a stronger faith. How do we get a stronger faith? By obeying that word that we know. When we obey the gospel, our own faith is strengthened and, and uh, confirmed. The Lord rewards faithfulness. Also, going back to my little example about running shoes, if I tell you again that you should wear New Balance running shoes because they're the best and I wear something else, it might cast doubt on the goodness of New Balance running shoes, but it might also cast doubt on my preaching, my message, the way I live it, that I don't believe that New Balance is so good. And it's the same way if I preach the gospel but don't live according to it, it means that I mess, probably don't believe it too much myself. And that's a problem if we're trying to make disciples. James says, faith without works is dead. It has no power. And the New Testament preach, uh, teaches that if we believe it, we do act it out. Whatever we don't do, we don't believe. It's that simple according to the Bible. If we truly, the things we truly believe, we truly act on. And faith has as necessary fruits, actions. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said in chapter 7, By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. And he goes on to describe that what is in our heart comes out in our lives. So by acting on your faith, by obeying the gospel, our own faith also is strengthened and it's confirmed. Thirdly, we obey because Jesus said so. I mean, it's pretty simple. Jesus said, teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. He commanded it. God said so in Leviticus numerous times, be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. And all throughout the word is that constant exhortation to obey. Moses said it in our first reading. If we have nothing, no other reason but because God said so, that's a good enough reason. After all, he created us. And he certainly knows what's best for us. He loves us as well. And so that's what's good for us to do. We obey because it's commanded. Fourthly, we obey out of gratitude. The Bible makes clear that God saved us because we're incapable of saving ourselves. We need saving. We were created in his image originally, but we threw that away. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death, but God showed us his love in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus rose from the dead, you will be saved, the Bible says. Because God loved the world so much, he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And so with all that God has done for us, it's the height of ingratitude not to respond, not to obey 
his word when he's done so much for us. As Romans 12 then says, in view of all his mercy, in other words, since he's done so much for you, offer yourselves, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Fifthly, we obey out of love. The Bible makes clear also, we love because God first loved us. Not only did he save us through Jesus' life and death and resurrection, he created us, he cares for us. He makes the sun to rise on the good and evil. He makes the rain to fall on the righteous and unrighteous. He gives us each day our daily bread. Jesus promised, seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things. In other words, all the things we need for this life will be given you as well. What kindness. What's not to love about a God like that? And Jesus reminded us in John 14, three times in the space of a couple of paragraphs at the Last Supper, as Jesus was preparing the disciples for his departure, Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commands. Love just simply does that. When we love someone, we want to do their will. That's what love is, sacrificing ourselves for the other. But having said all that, we go back always, we're saved by grace through faith. And so why? What's the importance? Why should we? What does it mean then to obey? If we're saved by grace through faith, what's the real reasons? What does it mean? I think it can best be described by a couple of illustrations. First of all, if you were invited to a formal dinner, but you had no concept of manners, what do you do with all these forks and spoons? Do you eat with your fingers? No, you don't. If you, if you don't know how to handle yourself, you might embarrass, you will embarrass yourself, you might offend your host, and you probably won't be invited to such an event again. It's kind of like that with heaven. Jesus told a parable about that, comparing heaven to a feast. And he said in Matthew 22, when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. Friend, he asked, how did you get in here without, we without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Then the king told his attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. If we never practiced, we like to play the game of basketball. I've read recently, you know, soccer is the most uh, popular sport in the world and basketball is the number two sport in terms of popularity. If we never practiced, how would we feel out on the field or in the court? We'd be pretty uncomfortable there, wouldn't we? We wouldn't know what to do. We wouldn't like it. We wouldn't be any good. It's the same with spiritual things. If we never practice, if we don't do the thing God wants us to do on this earth, are we sure we'll be comfortable in heaven? Will we know what to do? Will we be welcome there? We'll be like foreigners, people in a strange land. Paul tells us in Colossians chapter 3, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. We practice because practice does make perfect. And no, we won't achieve perfection in this life, but we'll certainly be familiar with what heaven is like by living the Christ-like life on earth. Or if you told a friend in St. Louis that you were coming to visit, and so you got in the car, and you got out to the interstate, and you turned right and headed toward Nashville. It'd take you a long time to get to St. Louis going that way, wouldn't it? And no matter how much you believed you were going to St. Louis, you weren't going to get there. Not unless you turned around and went the other way. That's the way obedience is. No matter how sincere we believe, if we're believing the wrong thing, if we're going the wrong way, we're not going to get there. 
If, we're not, if we, our actions don't line up with what we've said, we're still not going to make it. Hi, uh, Isaiah 35, a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. The unclean will not journey on it. It will be for those who walk on that way. That highway to heaven is the way of obedience. Obedience to our Lord Jesus Christ is the way of life and salvation. It's how our faith is made perfect. It's how we practice for that day when we will see the Lord face to face. The path of holiness is the highway to heaven. Let us be diligent to be found in that way also because it helps us make disciples and bring others also on that path to life. May we be found on that way ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen.